Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Con mucho gusto, uh, yo soy aquí en um, esta uh, conference histórica uh, de mujeres y tecnología. I think from the beginning of time, uh, 10,000 years ago, women have always been at the center of innovation and technology. Without women, there would be no agriculture, no medicine for thousands of years. And um, while it's true that for many centuries our contributions in innovation and technology have kind of been limited and, and suppressed, uh, now is the time, this 21st century, when we're flying forth like a thousand birds free to the sky. And I think um, that uh, innovation and technology will never be the same again. I'm hoping this morning to share with everybody a um, few insights on innovation and technology that um, I've obtained from my life, and I kind of break it into four chapters that I'll quickly move through. But I think you can summarize these lessons with just uh, four syllables, which I call C, Q, Love, Do. And it stands for curiosity, question authority, act lovingly, and do practically. So I'll apply these uh, four syllables in um, each of four chapters of my life as I move forward here. So chapter one is uh, Sirius XM. How many of you are subscribers to Sirius XM? Thank you. <laughs> so it started with uh, curiosity. I was uh, brought up very interested in NASA and space. And I was curious why we could get radio signals sent from NASA space probes out to Jupiter and beyond. But uh, before 2000, there was no radio signals coming from satellites in Earth orbit down to people on the Earth. We listened to all of our radio from ground-based transmitters. So this was my curiosity. Um, I was told that the reason for this was that the NASA radio signals are received by very large, gigantic Earth stations. Um, you could see a picture of the first one that I saw on the Seychelles Islands here. And that, of course, such gigantic uh, domed Earth stations would be completely impractical to have on the top of your car. Even the biggest RV would fall over. So um, it was impractical, I was told, to have radio from satellites down to cars and, and, of course, down to handheld radios. But this is where you have to question authority. And um, so I questioned that. And I got uh, right to work on trying to find if there wasn't some way that I could make a handheld device that could receive uh, radio signals from satellites and Earth. So first I made the uh, first handheld uh, satellite transceiver was called the Geostar transceiver. You could see it on the right here. It couldn't receive a radio signal, but it could receive uh, text messages, kind of like tweets, and it could send them back and forth directly uh, via satellites. So right away, that kind of popped a, 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 put a hole in the authorities' balloon that handheld devices could not receive satellite signals. And then I went on and created another type of uh, handheld device it was a handheld GPS receiver married to a uh, sonar fish finder so that people who were fishing could use the sonar to see where the fish were under the water, and, based, and then they could push a button to know the lat-long coordinates of it so they could always go right back to the spot in the uh, big lake or ocean where the fish was. So by now I knew that the authority was, was not correct completely. But that's not enough to really create the innovation and technology. I didn't really have any love for sending alphanumeric messages. It was cool, it was neat, but it wasn't anything that really turned me on. I didn't really have any love about making the fish finder. To tell you the truth, I worried if I was being responsible for like hurting too many fish, so. <laughs> um, but what I did have love for was what got me started in this whole thing which was the idea of radio to the whole world. 
And those, uh, that Seychelles Islands is on the other half of the world. And I saw there that the people there want to have a good quality of life and they want to have peace, just like everybody here. So I began to really get passionate about the idea that we could use satellites in orbit to broadcast uh, radio stations that would, you know, music, that's the universal language. Everybody loves music. And generally speaking, it spreads a very positive message that we could use satellites to help unite the world. That's where my love came from that allowed me to end up creating Sirius XM. You need to have love for what you do. You need to act lovingly because right away, you're going to come into many, many objections and many obstacles. And only love will power you through it. For example, when I started to uh, design now a handheld device to receive a radio signal from a satellite, it took a lot of money uh, to build a satellite and launch a satellite. And I had to build the most powerful satellites that there had ever been before so the signal would be strong enough to be received by a handheld radio. And uh, I had to go to Wall Street to get this money. It was literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And of course, Wall Street wanted to see a return on investment. So I had to really act very practically. While my goal was to unite the world with radio, it was clear to me that the first step would have to be to unite just North America with radio and to create a radio service from satellites that could go directly to cars. And that would be a first step to going to handheld devices. People in cars would be willing to pay a monthly subscription fee. And that monthly subscription fee would be enough money to pay the investors a good return on their investment. So just as important as acting lovingly is doing practically. So I began SiriusXM as a satellite to car subscription radio service. Still, if it wasn't for my love of the notion of satellite radio, I couldn't overcome all the objections. There is a very good video. You're, you're, I encourage you to um, stream it from Amazon um, or wherever called Radio Wars. And it tells the story of how all the AM and FM broadcasters did everything they could to try to get the FCC to not approve uh, Sirius XM. But uh, finally, we won. And I put here, love powers persistence. If you don't have a strong love for something, it'll be almost impossible to go through all the objections. And it would take me a day to recount all the objections. So, uh, but ultimately, persistence is omnipotence. And uh, to this day, I'm amazed more people have thanked me for bringing Howard Stern to small little nooks and crannies. The, uh, just like two or three weeks ago, I was at the US-Canadian border, a small little border town, uh, only two little Canadian border agents there. And the, the, um, they looked up my name, my passport, and then she came out and said, are you the one who invented Sirius XM? And I said, yes. And she said, may I give you a hug? I have to tell you, I have never received a hug from a border agent in my life. <laughs> I don't think it's in their playbook. Um, but she was so grateful that Howard Stern was available to her on this little tiny town in, in um, the Canadian border with New Hampshire. And even Howard Stern himself is pretty grateful. Let's see if this video will play. This is an exciting time. I mean, you invented this whole deal, and here we are. We're enjoying it. And as a broadcaster, I said this to you in the hall, and I'll say it to you on the air. I thank you. If you hadn't invented this medium, I mean, the fact that I'm getting to look at the invent this is like me meeting Marconi. If, if, if you hadn't invented this medium, I, w I would have been out of the radio business. I liked it better when you said this is like meeting Martin Luther Queen. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But it's true. Did you say that? I did. You're a witty guy. <laughs> but uh, i got to tell you something. I am so grateful that you invented this medium. I mean, I am flourishing here and also able to be part of something from the ground up. But I mean, this has got to be nuts. This was a dream in your head, and now you're seeing it all come together. What is your... So, it's an wow. exciting time. I mean, you invented this whole... Sorry. There we go. Okay, so uh, that's chapter one. And um, you can see the uh, CQ, love, do played out there. So now I'll show how it's played out in a second chapter of my life, which uh, I would call the uh, Unifair chapter. Unifair is the short name we use for our company, United Therapeutics.
So uh, shortly after uh, Sirius got up and running, our youngest daughter, Genesis, was diagnosed with a uh, generally fatal uh, condition called pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH. And it was, it came like out of no place. Um, she wasn't even 10 years old. And the doctors explained to us that uh, with this condition, it's like the normal people are on the right and the people with the PAH medical condition are on the left. All of the arteries, which are the blue ones uh, in their lungs, become very, very narrow and small. And there's actually millions of these arteries in your lungs. And so when the heart tries to pump the blood through them to get oxygen, it's not possible. And generally speaking, uh, the doctor said, your, your daughter is going to die in probably three to five years. We're, we're sorry, but there's no medicines approved, no place in the world. And not everybody, but almost everybody dies of this condition. So of course, um, uh, my partner, Bina and I, we were, we were like uh, just devastated, we cried. And, um, but I was, I, again, the curiosity um, seemed to me here that um, I understood that arteries and veins are two different kinds of blood vessels. The veins in your body bring the blood to the heart and the arteries in your body bring the blood from the heart. Now, um, only one kind of arteries go have a low amount of oxygen, deoxygenated blood. It's the arteries from the heart to the lungs, which are called the pulmonary arteries. And those are the ones you see in this picture. All the other arteries in your body, in your arms, in your legs, in the trunk of your body, all the other arteries carry oxygenated blood because it's the blood that's pumped from the heart to the rest of the body, and they already receive oxygen from the lungs. So I thought like maybe there could be uh, some possibility of a medicine that would talk, a, a chemical, a molecule that would talk just to the deoxygenated arteries because it was clear that these arteries are different than every other artery in your body. So um, I mentioned this to a lot of doctors who I was trying to find um, help Genesis. You can see a picture of her there. And um, everybody said to me, you know, a parent cannot develop a medicine. Uh, it's a very cute idea that you have, Martine, but uh, you're, you're a satellite communications expert. You, you know, the authority was a, a parent cannot develop a medicine. However, as you certainly could appreciate, um, a parent has infinite love for their daughter and their son and, and their family. And uh, Bina and I committed ourselves that we would find a medicine, despite what all the authorities said. And there were just countless uh, trials and tribulations involved in trying to find a medicine that would just talk to the arteries that were deoxygenated and uh, take it through all the FDA trials and finally get approved by the FDA. Uh, the medicine we found, by the way, it was um, locked up in a, a giant pharmaceutical company the pharmaceutical company didn't want to develop it because they said only 3,000 people have your daughter's illness. We'll never break even with the cost of the medicine for just 3,000 people. Um, finally, I persuaded them to sell it to me and that I would try to do it. And then um, it turned out that the medicine that they had, it had only been produced up to one gram amount, not even enough for one person to take for a month, certainly not enough for a clinical trial. It turned out there was nobody knew how to make this molecule because it was so complicated enough for a medicine. So I had to search the whole country over and over to find somebody who could make it. Um, after trial and error, we found somebody. Then when they made it, this medicine was what has a called what's called a half-life of just a half hour. In other words, it's used in the body and finished up in a half hour. Well, you can't take a pill every you know half hour, it's impractical. So this medicine would have to be infused into the body like with a pump, 24 hours a day, um, 365 days a year. No such pump had ever existed, so we had to invent that as well. I mean, only love can power you through innovation, trials, and tribulations. But finally, we succeeded, and our first product was called Remodulin, and you can see the miniature 
pump that's used there to pump it um, into the patient 24 hours a day. We were allowed, we made it in a way that the patient could still have a good lifestyle. You see that uh, this lady's returned to being able to do rollerblading with it. Um, my daughter, however, is a little bit um, picky. And she said, um, well, Martine, it's, it's so good that you got Vermogen approved, but could you get something approved? I don't have to have a catheter stuck into me forever. So um, we worked on that, and even though people said it was impossible to ever make an inhaled form of this medicine because of the short half-life I mentioned, we finally figured out a way using a nebulizer to make an inhaled form that you breathe just four times a day, and yet it lasts in your body the same as when it's pumped via um, the first product 24 hours a day. That was a revolutionary development. And then uh, Genesis pushed me yet further, and she said, um, how about a pill? That would be even easier. <laughs> she definitely, this is a case where the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> so uh, we were able to um, develop a pill. You see it here in the bottom corner called uh, Arenatram. And here's a, it was our most recent approval, approved just last year. Uh, we have uh, altogether now uh, actually five medicines approved by the FDA. And uh, here's a video of the most recent approval. From the beginning, we have been obsessed with reshaping our world. Driven by inspiration, infused with innovation, relentless in our quest to get it right, we rediscover ourselves over and over again, delivering on the promise we made to so many people so long ago. Where will it lead us next? Surely, things will never look the same again. Or Renetran. The future is now. I love how the color and font matches like so well with the uh, Women Innovation and Technology color and font. Okay, so there we go. So um, an important thing that I've learned from this is as our company began building up, and uh, just to give you a sense of scale, when we started the company, uh, we had to buy this medicine from Glaxo, the big pharmaceutical company. It wasn't even a medicine. We had no revenues. Nobody thought we would succeed with even one medicine, uh, much less now we have five. Um, as we began to grow, our revenues went to the tens of millions of dollars and then to the hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, big pharmaceutical companies then began sniffing around us and trying to buy us. But I knew that if we let ourselves get bought, how could we de continue developing our mission to make really great medicines available um, for people? So I developed this uh, chart of the virtuous circle, which I just keep uh, showing to everybody in our company. And it starts up there at the um, top with, um, with a uh, commitment to, um, in this case, it's a commitment to excellence. It's a commitment to, to our daughter and to the thousands of other uh, men and women like our daughter who have orphan diseases that people don't really care about. We try to make the best possible medicines, and then this Excellence has led to us having um, the top market share in each of our areas. In fact, now our revenues are over $1.3 billion a year. Um, our market cap is about $8 billion. This is for like something that everybody said was impossible. And um, so all of that, of course, drives the stock price, which is now like the, around the highest it's ever been, around like $170 a share. And that makes us too expensive for people to buy, so that's a good thing. So with all of your companies that, you, that all of you are developing out there, maintain a commitment to excellence. That will make sure that you have great products, great market share, and a high stock price and can remain independent. Well, I think this entire story would actually uh, not be even a glass half full if it wasn't for the best part of all which is that um, our daughter, trying to advance this, yeah. Our daughter is now um, 30 uh, years old, um, healthy and happy. 
just a couple of years ago, our company turned uh, 15 years old. And we look at the company as a, as a wonderful woman itself. And so when a wonderful woman uh, such as United Therapeutics turns 15, she deserves her own quinceanera. <laughs> so we threw a great quinceanera for uh, United Therapeutics. And we invited up on stage you know, one person who was uh, crucial for each year of uh, this lady's uh, young life. Our, our daughter Genesis was the first because without her there would be no company. Um, her mother Bina was second. And these are all the different doctors and scientists who each of them in their own way were essential. Somebody figuring out how to manufacture the medicine, somebody helping with the FDA, so on. But um, the best part of all was that these medicines, which when my daughter was diagnosed, um, didn't exist. And there were only 3,000 people with the disease because everybody died. People constantly get this illness naturally but everybody died in three to five years, so the number could never get to be more than 3,000. Today, there's more than 30,000 people living normal lives with this illness, taking the medicines, and that's a whole football stadium of people who wouldn't even be alive without these medicines. But to me, the very favorite person in that football stadium is Genesis. Oops, back. Uh, can you guys bring it back and click the video? Back, video, play the video. So that's technology and innovation um, serving people in life. I'd like to now turn to chapter three. Um, when Genesis was diagnosed, the uh, doctor said there's no medicines approved. As you've seen, now there are several. But um, the only hope for the patient is to get a lung transplant. And um, however, there are very few lungs available. Only about uh, 2,000 lungs um, are transplanted each year. But uh, more than a quarter million people have end-stage lung disease, either pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, COPD. Many of you, if any of you are uh, Star Trek fans, you may have heard recently that Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, he died of a COPD. So it got me very interested in the whole situation of why are there not enough organs for transplantation. I knew that 40% uh, of Americans carry an organ donor card. And it's a similar percentage in uh, most European countries and many other countries. But if almost half the people carry an organ donor card, why is there only enough organs for just 2,000 people a year? I mean, 40% of America, that's like 100 million people, OK? So I, was, I had a lot of curiosity about why there weren't enough organs. And uh, people explained to me that, well, the reason for this is that we can only use organs that uh, arise when somebody dies of brain death, like a stroke or a, a, in a car accident but that 99% of people die of what's called heart death, like a, a heart attack, something like that. And by the time they um, are able to get to a place of donating their lung their, or the rest of their organs, there's been no blood flow through those organs for an hour, two hours more. And by that time, the organs are no good. So a lot of people told me the, the solution is to get 100% of Americans to be organ donors. And I think that's a great idea. I'm completely in favor of that. But, um, and for all other countries as well, everybody should be an organ donor. But I don't believe that's going to solve the problem. Because if 40% of, of the people is giving us only one red donor out of 100 people who need organs, then having 100% is maybe just two donors out of 100, two and a half. 
you're nowhere near solving the problem. So I began to uh, feel, um, again, uh, a passion for solving this problem because by now I had met so many patients with pulmonary hypertension. I'd met friends of my daughter who uh, died at the age of uh, 10, 11, and 12 uh, because either the medicines didn't work for them or they died before the medicines were approved by the FDA. I knew one delightful girl played beautiful piano. Um, she got a lung transplant. Her body rejected it. She was waiting for a second lung, but they're so rare, she waited a year and died in the hospital. And I just said, you know, this is wrong. There must be a way that science can solve this problem. So um, we've developed in our company a three-step strategy to solve this problem. Uh, the first step is to save those 99% of lungs which are donated but discarded. Only one out of 100 lungs that are donated are actually used. The, other, the rest of them are just like uh, disposed of in, in the bio waste, literally. And we invented a technology called ex vivo perfusion, where a lung which is not good enough for a transplant surgeon can be, the lung itself can be treated as a patient in this ex vivo perfusion machine we invented. And after several hours, it turns out that the lung can be made healthy enough that transplant surgeons will want to use it. And here's a little video of uh, how we um, saved this um, lung. A pre-EVLP biopsy is taken. The perfusion circuit is then primed, including drug addition. The heater cooler is connected to the heat exchanger. Then lungs are transferred to the procedure table by EVLP specialists. Pressure lines are zeroed. Cannulas are connected up to the perfusion circuit and air is purged from the lines. The perfusion pump is started and with this step, the EVLP procedure clock starts. Perfusion continues over a four to six hour period with ongoing CMX documentation and assessment steps. These include bronchoscopy, x-rays, blood gas analysis, both on a regular and an as needed basis. Throughout this period, the IT specialists in our command center facilitate visual and data communication with Toronto General Hospital and the transplant surgeons, keeping them informed on an at least hourly basis. At the three hour mark of perfusion, the collective team makes an initial assessment of the lungs. If the decision is made to go ahead with transplantation, the primary EVLP specialist contacts the transplant center to arrange transportation. After all the data is collected and the Toronto General Hospital surgeon and transplant surgeon agree on cessation of EVLP, the case is locked and a disposition email is automatically sent to the Toronto General Hospital surgeon, the transplant surgeon, and finally to the OPO, which confirms transfer of custody to the transplant center. Cooldown commences and once the cold temperature set point is reached, cannulas are clamped and the lungs are disconnected and moved to the back table. The EVLP procedure clock is stopped. The lungs are then flushed with steam and stored in Perfidex. The EVLP specialists remove the cannulas, staple the trachea, and perform a post-EVLP biopsy. So that was a lung that no transplant surgeon wanted after the patient uh, um, was deceased and there was a, a cadaveric donation. We treated it for four hours, seeing the procedure that you showed there. After that, the transplant surgeon says, oh, that lung looks really good now, we'll use it. It's um, then flown to the hospital where the transplant surgeon is. They transplanted it, and the patient is now out and walking about and has a whole new life. We just started doing that two years ago. Already 300 lives have been saved with this procedure. Did you see how lovingly the uh, med techs handled the lung? It's beautiful. But um, this is, as you can see, it's a very labor-intensive uh, process, and um, we have an idea for two further steps that could expedite things tremendously and, and really provide a way for, for everybody to have a, a organ transplant who needs one. Oops, back, back one slide, please. Uh, can we go back one slide? Okay, so anyway, this is a, uh, an artist depiction of a facility that we're building that will use uh, genetically engineered pig organs. It turns out as a fluke of nature, the pig's heart and uh, lungs and kidneys are the same size and match and functionality as human ones. 
And uh, you may have even heard that people had a pig heart valve before because it's exactly the same match size as the human heart valve. Those heart valves, however, are just a form. All the living cells on it are killed, so there's nothing to create an immune reaction. We believe by making about one dozen uh, genetic modifications in the pig, the organs will be able to be transplanted into people without the need for immunosuppressants because they won't be rejected by the human body. And this facility here is designed to produce over, um, over 3,000 uh, organs um, every year just from this one facility right here. And we could then build several of these throughout the U.S. to cover maybe half or so of the, med of the demand for organ transplants. And then we're working on a yet larger facility where some of you may have heard that recently it's been discovered that stem cells uh, do not have to come embryonically, that, that any cell in your body can be turned back into a stem cell. It's called an IPS cell for inducible pluripotent stem cell. This was discovered just uh, 15 years ago. The Nobel Prize has already been given for it. And every major university in America are now making as many stem cells as they want just by using a skin cell or any cell from your body can be turned back into a stem cell. The cool thing about that is those cells have exactly your same DNA, so there's nothing to reject. What we're now working on in this new building here is to then re-differentiate that stem cell back into being the particular cells needed for lungs, the particular cells needed for hearts, particular cells needed for kidneys, so you could grow your own replacement lungs, organs, and kidneys if it turned out that you had end-stage organ disease. So this is really not science fiction. Um, I believe that before the end of this decade, we will already take uh, the first person with end-stage lung disease, transplant into them a genetically modified uh, a porcine lung, and return them safely to health. And before the end of the next decade, we'll be able to take a person with an end-stage heart, lung, liver, or kidney disease, transplant into them one of their own skin cells that have been turned into a pluripotent stem cell and then regenerated into a full organ and get a replacement organ for themselves. So death from end-stage organ disease should be, be left in the dustbin of history. Thank you. So I'd now like to uh, wrap up with a chapter four uh, told, called uh, Mind Cloning. So here where the curiosity kicked in is um, I was curious that information technology was advancing so quickly, as you can see from this chart, that it's predicted that like within something like 20 years, computers and software will have the same capability in terms of information processing um, as the human mind. In other words, that software will become equivalent to mindware within the next 20 years. So I was, I was very, very curious about that. And it led me to ask the question, would it be possible the way that we can extend somebody's life by regenerating organs through a transplant, would it be possible to maybe transplant somebody's mind into software if they were suffering from an end-stage uh, brain disease, um, such as Alzheimer's or a stroke, or if they were a soldier or a, a first responder, serving their community or country, and, and they were in a, a terrible accident, would it be possible to transplant their mind into software? Here again, I had to question authority, because people told me, Martin, that's impossible. Computers, the brain is not a computer. Whatever a computer is, the brain is not a computer. But I was skeptical, because I learned to be a helicopter pilot to help deliver our organs to patients. And I knew that uh, planes were not birds, and helicopters are not hummingbirds but they do fly pretty well. And it seems to me that like similar functionality can come from different forms. So um, this was like a really tall order to create something like Mindware. And, um, and I really, you know, I have a full-time job, so I didn't really have much time to work on this. It's more than I can do just to work on creating an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. But uh, my lovely uh, partner, Bina, she and I have been together a really long time. And as we're doing things like walking the dogs in the morning, we began to think like, you know, is there some way that like our love affair could be continued after our bodies uh, give out? And you can get a little bit of a snippet of how 
loving, act lovingly empowers my interest in mind cloning from this video. Let me introduce to my far left, Dr. Martine Rothblatt and her wife, Bina. Um, and before we get into the science, may we just sort of get all the domestic stuff out of the way? You guys have been married for how many years? 31, almost 32. And when you met? Los Angeles kids who fell in love with each other. And Martine, when you met, you were not Martine. Uh, no. Do you want to explain who you were? <laughs> no. Do I have to be Chelsea Handler? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm a transgendered woman. And um, so when we met we were and married, we were um, a heterosexual couple. And, um, but we loved each other's souls. And during the course of our 32 years, we've uh, transitioned into becoming a transgendered couple. And along the course of the way, we've had four children, now four grandchildren, four, uh, three Labradoodles and a Beagle. <laughs> and uh, Bina has a couple dozen chickens. <laughs> and so, I think so that's the story. Interracial before most people did it, transgender before most people did it, and a marriage that lasts, which people just don't do, period. <laughs> so congrats. So we began wondering, you know, is there some way that uh, marriages and love in particular can even transcend your body? And we had the idea that uh, while there is not mindware available now, and computers are still like 20 years away from where we want to go, the thoughts of people, their personality, their mannerisms, their recollections, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, and values, uh, those things are available now. And we do have with social media, all the tools that we need to capture people's mannerisms, personality, recollections, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, and values. In fact, it can all be captured without really people doing anything. Just you know, naturally, your interaction on your social media sites will capture so much of you. And now I think you know, there's a big movement in social media toward kind of like you know, full-time screening, things like Meerkat and technologies such as that, um, immersive media. Um, I think the, the um, blending of fashion and technology is going to further accelerate the automatic, what we call mind filing, of all of your mind off your body in the cloud. So we created a foundation um, called the uh, Terrasim Foundation. It's got a website, LifeNot, kind of like Astronaut is exploring space and LifeNot is exploring your life. And there are tools there where all of your Facebook posts or Instagram, whatever, can automatically be captured and built up in a mind file. Some people um, are even thinking about in the future that if they save some of their DNA, that uh, you could regenerate a whole body the way today we are regenerating your lungs, your hearts, your kidney, uh, skin, and whatnot. So there's a place where you could, um, for $99, you can store your DNA and it's free to store your mind file, and it will always be free because we just endowed this um, foundation as a way for people to extend their life uh, indefinitely. Now, some, again, uh, people questioned whether this was sensible, and people pointed out that, uh, well, even if you captured your person's whole mind, that's not really capturing their soul. And I don't know that. I mean, you know, that's a question that really is more in the realm of God. But I do believe that uh, when you see a little baby growing up, um, you see as its, as its mind begins to develop, even from the very first days, its soul begins to be expressed. So I think like just like the soul emerges from the mind, um, just like I think the future is going to emerge from this eMERGE conference, um, I believe our consciousness will emerge from our mind files. Let me wrap up by suggesting a few things we can do right now um, as we get ready for this world of the future where people could have an unlimited supply of transplantable organs or perhaps even their mind files can live indefinitely and then be downloaded back into regenerated bodies. I think first and foremost, most important, we have to teach the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's a totally awesome document. It really contains all the human rights that uh, people need to have. And that's something that should be taught to everybody you know, in every year of school and every year of adulthood. Uh, secondly, I believe that we need to grant citizenship and, and respect to all undocumented uh, immigrants. Pe thank you. Thank you. 
I point out to people that um, you know a lot of tech people they're like interested in cyberspace and this mind cloning thing. I say you got to re realize that the mind clones will be immigrants and initially undocumented immigrants from cyberspace. Um, why don't we first you know do a really good job of respecting the people who are migrating from real space, and then we'll have a really good law set of laws in place to welcome everybody migrating from cyberspace. So that helps them get it. Um, so to wrap up, um, things like everybody to take away from this is curiosity and question authority, CQ. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said the most important thing we could do is question authority. I have uh, little posters around um, our company. I say that uh, my best friends are the people who question me because they're, they're telling me either there might be a cliff right behind me or there might be a great opportunity in front of me that I'm not seeing. Uh, secondly, um, act lovingly. If you act lovingly, you can accomplish anything. You will have the power of persistence if you're acting from love, and persistence creates omnipotence. And most of all, do practically. No paper project ever fails. Um, every long uh, run is a set of short runs, um, and it's foolish to ignore the short runs. Savor every you know, base hit that you accomplish. Uh, do practically, and you can create great things. Thank you very much. And if you'd like more information, there's like a book, Virtually Human, I'll be signing this afternoon. And there's a, a movie about this that you could uh, um, stream or download called The Singularity of Snare. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.